A huge dog tracked down a litter of orphaned wolf cubs. But then, something incredible happened. Bella gazed into the distance. Each of her steps was measured, as if she was tracing an invisible path through the woods. The German Shepherd wolf mix was following a scent that tugged at something deep and primal inside her. As Bella ventured further into the woods, a sense of urgency enveloped her. She had to find them. Now. And so she did, and that's when she knew her nose had brought her to the right place. Or her heart. In the rugged and pristine wilderness of Alaska, Bella, the German Shepherd wolf mix, was profoundly melancholic. She was once a bundle of energy and joy, but her spirit had dulled. The loss of her litter of puppies had hit her hard. It was the second litter she'd lost, and a mother's sadness hung like a dark cloak around her. Michael's soul was intertwined with the Alaskan wilderness. He had raised Bella from a puppy and watched her transformation with a growing sense of unease. He understood she was mourning the loss of her puppies in her own way, but she didn't seem to be getting over it. Her coat had lost its luster, and her eyes, instead of sparkling with mischief, now held a distant, pensive look. Granted, it had only been a week and a bit, but this was unnatural. He tried to distract her with extra walks along her favorite trails and super big helpings of her favorite treats, but Bella was lost in a world of her own. She almost felt unreachable. As the days passed, Bella began to withdraw even more. She hardly wagged her tail anymore, and the doggy smile Michael loved so much was all but a memory. Bella disappeared into the Alaskan wilderness around their cottage for hours at a time. Often, she stayed out all night and then returned silently with the first light. Her absences were disconcerting. It was unlike her. They were a team. They stood by each other through thick and thin. This was different, and he feared Bella was slipping away from him, that the bond between them was fraying. Why was she so drawn to the wilderness? What was she searching for, alone among the towering pines and along the icy riverbanks? The least he could do was try to find the answers, Michael thought. Maybe something primal in her was looking for her puppies. As the dawn broke with streaks of orange and pink, Bella set off once again. Michael snuck out and set off after her, making sure he stayed at least a hundred yards behind her. In the distance, Bella's shape was a ghostly silhouette mist. Michael followed. He tried to be silent, but Bella wasn't out for a stroll. She ran between the trees and through the underbrush, as if she knew exactly where she was going, as if she had traveled this route many times before. For a while, his eyes stayed fixed on Bella, but then he lost her altogether. Michael now had to rely on his tracking skills. Following the signs Bella left behind, he ventured deeper into the woods. The world around him grew wilder, and he was more aware of the untamed heart of the Alaskan wilderness than ever before. Sometimes, he lost her trail. Then, he walked in widening circles until he picked up a sign again and continued in his pursuit. Finally, in a secluded glen cradled by ancient trees, he spotted Bella, but she wasn't alone. The scene before him took his breath away. Bella was curled protectively around a tiny huddle of what looked like wolf pups. Michael's hackles raised. Instinctively, he looked around for the wolf mother, but they were alone, he, Bella, and the baby wolves. The pups nuzzled against Bella, and then Michael was aghast once again. She was nursing them. Bella's strange behavior, her disappearances, and all-nighters suddenly started making sense to him. She'd been nursing this litter of wolves for a while now. That's why she disappeared, as if she deliberately kept it a secret from him. But there was a deep natural logic to it all too, or so Michael thought. She'd lost her own puppies, and somehow she had discovered the wolf den. If this was the spot she'd been returning to every day, and he had no doubt it was, then the mother must have disappeared. Bella had become a surrogate for these orphaned wolves, and in that way, her maternal instinct was satisfied. Only, this was motherly care that transcended the boundaries between species. Or did it? He knew German Shepherds share 99.9% .9 of their DNA with wolves and are said to be descendants of the Grey Wolves. Plus, Bella wasn't purely a German Shepherd. She was a wolf hybrid. So, it only made sense that the picture before him wasn't entirely as far-fetched as it seemed at first. 
Sheltered in the underbrush and believing Bella was none the wiser about his presence, Michael suddenly had a few important decisions to make. These pups were safe, for now, and so was Bella. If the mother wolf was still alive, she would have returned by now and chased Bella off. But what was to be done about the pups? Sure, Bella could raise them until they were weaned, but what then? How would they learn the wolf behavior that was essential for their survival? In an instant, Michael decided not to interfere with the status quo for now. He would contact Sean Doherty, a local wildlife expert, and ask him for advice. Sean was what many called a wild man. He'd grown up in the Alaskan wilderness, much like Michael, but he'd made studying the fauna and flora his life's calling. Silently, Michael hoped Sean was in town. He often wasn't. Sean frequently made trips into the wilderness and often stayed away for weeks at a time. He was a loner, and nobody ever knew where he went on these expeditions of his, or how long he would stay away. Michael retreated quietly from the glen. On the way back to their cottage, Michael's mind was a whirl of questions and emotions. He was determined to protect Bella and her newfound family. More than that, he had a burning desire to understand the bond that had formed in the shadow of the forest. Bella, in her grief, had found a new calling and Michael would do everything in his power to support her. The next morning, Michael was offered a whiskey. It wasn't even nine o'clock yet. He sat in Sean Doherty's cluttered living room, sneezed from the dust, and waited for the wild man to sit down. When Michael started speaking, Sean listened intently. When he was done, silence hung in the air for a while. Sean was organizing his thoughts. What followed was deeply disturbing. Sean started telling him about the lucrative trade in wolf pelts. It was a dark business with a ready market on the internet. But there was a twist. Poaching wild wolves was becoming more trouble than it was worth. If a poacher was caught, he would stare a lengthy prison sentence in the face. So, like most criminal enterprises do, poachers had evolved. Illegal breeding facilities were cropping up everywhere. Instead of killing wolves, poachers now trapped or darted them. The animals were then transported to these clandestine facilities where they were bred to exhaustion. Adult wolves were slaughtered for their pelts and sold into a ready market. The story horrified Michael. But what about the pups Bella found, he asked. Sean told him that the poachers would have seen she was a nursing female. That would have made her incredibly valuable. If the poachers could find the pups and return to the breeding facility with the mother and her offspring, a huge payday awaited them. But something probably went wrong. Either the wolf fought back during the capture process and had to be killed, or she died of stress while all of it was happening. Then, Sean frowned and said, I have no doubt they looked for the pups. It's just luck they didn't find them, but my concern is that they'll be back on the off chance the pups survived. It's just too valuable a prize to pass up. Sean sipped at his second whiskey as he prepared breakfast. He suggested Michael allow Bella to continue nursing the wolf litter for a few more days. The pups were fragile and they'd need her care to survive. But then, it was essential to move them to a rehabilitation center. They would have to be raised to release them back into the wild. Sean promised to make a few calls and set the whole process in motion. But he stressed that Bella needed to continue taking care of the pups until they were ready to be moved. From there, he would ensure that they were raised in a controlled environment before their eventual release. Michael now doubled his efforts with Bella. When she returned from one of her sojourns, he made a fuss of her and praised her. He adapted her diet to suit her nutritional needs as a nursing mother and made sure she had access to the inside of the cottage whenever she needed it. But at the same time, a sense of unease settled over the usually tranquil wilderness around Michael and Bella's home. Local newspapers seldom carried anything more than community stories sparsely peppered with a few articles of national interest. But all of the stories from beyond the Alaskan wilderness seemed a lifetime away. Now, it was changing. Grim headlines trumpeted the news of a series of wolf killings in the area. Each report detailed the brazenness of the poachers. Their deadly presence cast a long shadow over the entire region. Michael had picked up a few newspapers in town before he headed home. As he read the first of the articles, a chill ran down his spine. The threat was closer and more real than he had imagined. And it could be deadly for the pups, and by implication, Bella. Sean's words still rang in his head. The poachers would, in all likelihood, continue their search for the pups. 
and if they found the baby wolves, they'd find Bella. Michael knew she would defend them with her own life, and that couldn't end well. There was a deep, gnawing fear in his belly. Michael knew he would have to take every possible precaution to protect them from the looming danger. The first step was to fortify his own property. He installed security cameras that were permanently focused on the tree line around the cottage. Then, he decided to return to the wolf den. He would camp there until the arrangements for the removal of the pups were made. Bella acknowledged his presence when he arrived, but didn't get up. She was again curled up around the pups like she'd been when Michael had discovered them. Instead of pushing her, he kept his distance. He made a makeshift camp around 50 yards from the den and settled in. Night after night, he patrolled a wide perimeter around the den. His eyes scanned the darkness in the forest and his ears strained to hear the faintest rustle or snap of a twig. On the third night, disaster struck. Bella snuck away into the trees, alerted by a sound she didn't like. Michael had dozed off and noticed her absence too late. He woke up from the unmistakable crack of a rifle shot. He flew out of his sleeping bag and chambered around in his rifle. It was almost impossible to determine the direction from which the gunfire had come. The sound of the shot ricocheted from the trees and echoes built upon echoes, camouflaging its origin. But he ran from his makeshift camp anyway. He did what he did when he tracked Bella on the first day. Michael moved in ever-widening circles until he found her. When he did, he fired two quick rounds in different directions to let the poachers know someone was ready to fight back. Then, Michael dropped to his knees. Bella had been shot. She'd probably been mistaken for a wolf because of her size and had become an unintended victim of their illicit hunt. The bullet had grazed her flank and sent her tumbling down a short incline. She was dazed and confused, but she tried to stand up. Whimpering and limping, she walked around Michael, weakly wagging her tail. The sight of Bella, injured in this way, ignited an unknown fury in Michael. He carefully lifted Bella in his arms and then slid her over his shoulders. When he was sure she was as comfortable as possible, he set off in the direction of the wolf den. From there, it was about a mile to his cabin, and from there he would drive her to the vet in town. The pups would have to fend for themselves now. Their removal was no more than a day in the future now, so Michael decided not to take them to the cabin with him and Bella. The less human contact they had at this point, the easier their eventual rehabilitation would be. The incident had marked a turning point in Bella and Michael's quiet Alaskan existence. The threat was no longer abstract. It had manifested in the most painful and personal way. As soon as she was patched up and bandaged, the news of Bella's shooting spread like wildfire through the community. Everybody in the small town knew her. The news that someone had tried to harm her sparked a wildfire of indignation and a fervent desire for justice among the locals. Sean was on his way back with a team from a nearby wolf rehabilitation center. By sunrise the next morning, a group of about 12 men gathered at Michael's cabin. He sleepily opened the door and was confronted with a posse of heavily armed men, united in their anger and hunger for retribution. They were a hunting party, they said. Only, they weren't going to be hunting for wildlife. They were out to hunt the poachers. When Michael asked what they would do when they caught up with the illegal hunters, they smiled. One man drew a thumb across his throat. Nothing more needed to be said. Michael was immediately apprehensive. He understood their anger. Heck, he felt it himself. And he shared their desire for justice. But not in this way. Retribution was not the answer. Justice must be served, but not like this. It has to be through the law. His gaze swept the faces of the men around him. As he spoke, the tension in the air slowly dissipated. The men began to see reason, and 30 minutes later, they agreed to rally the Department of Wildlife and the local police and offer their help there. That afternoon, Bella returned to the pups. Michael followed on her heels. It was tough going for Bella, but she persisted. At the den, the pups greeted her with excited whining and started nursing even before she had a chance to lie down. It was here that Sean and the experts from the Wolf Rehabilitation Center found them. The time for the next crucial step in the survival of the wolf pups was at hand. The experts outlined their plan. As they discussed the logistics, one of the experts turned to Michael and made a request that carried enormous significance. On the one hand, it was a recognition of the tremendous bond that had formed between Bella and the pups. 
But, on the other hand, it would separate him and Bella for at least a month. Michael knew Bella's commitment to the pups, and he also knew how, despite being shot, the pups had helped her heal after she lost her own litter. He agreed on the spot. This made the plan perfect. Sean explained that Bella's presence would provide invaluable support for the pups during the first stage of their rehabilitation, and she would help to minimize human contact because she'd be taking care of their feeding. It was a win for the pups all the way. With the plan in place and Bella's participation secured, the pups were transported to the specialized facility where they would receive the care they needed. Meanwhile, the authorities snapped into action. Roadblocks were set up and an intelligence network began to work on tracking the poachers. Two days later, they were apprehended. Sean visited the cabin personally to share the news with Michael and at the same time assured him that Bella was doing just fine as were the wolf pups. By the time Bella was returned to Michael, syndicated newspapers and television channels had picked up on the story of the dog who was raising wolf pups. Bella arrived in town to a hero's welcome. She was a sensation in every sense of the word, but all she wanted was to see Michael. When the door of the sanctuary's vehicle opened, she flew out like gray lightning. Before he could anchor himself, she jumped into Michael's arms and toppled him over backward. So it was, in the untamed beauty of the Alaskan wilderness, that a single truth echoed loudly. Love, in all its forms, can bridge the deepest divides. Do you have a story of a dog caring for wild animals? Please tell us about it in the comments. We'd love to hear. For now, we're out of here. Catch you in the next video.